All right, hi everybody, and welcome to this next installment in the Across the Curriculum series, which is um, a series that the Lamson Academic Unit is doing to support um, any kind of sort of um, interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary information that might be useful to folks as they're thinking about curriculum. So uh, for this installment, we are really excited to have librarian Kristen Wixon with us, um, who at least for me is where I always, my go-to stop for um, information literacy questions. That's probably a phrase that she will um, deconstruct for us. But with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, uh, actually, hang on a sec while I share my screen. Oh, I'm not allowed. Maybe you would allow me to share the screen. Um, so yeah, so uh, if you haven't been able to attend other um, sessions in this uh, Cross the Curriculum series, um, you've missed some good ones. There was great um, digital habits of mind and writing. Um, but today, again, we're focusing on information literacy. This is my screen. Yeah. Um, and... All right, showing up okay? Great. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about information literacy um, or rather get you guys to talk about information literacy. Um, and the, the way I am structuring this is it's kind of centered on this a particular article um, that went out ahead of time. And also it's okay if you haven't looked at it ahead of time, um, but it's called Lizard People in the Library. It's by, by Barbara Fister, um, who is excellent. And it is from a, a whole series of essays coming out of the project Information Literacy, which is also excellent. Um, so I'm kind of going to use that as our framework. I'm going to pull some quotes out of there. Um, but I'm also going to bring in the, the digital habits of mind that Martha discussed in her session. I'm just going to put all these things next to each other um, and see if I can get you guys to, to talk a little bit about it. Um, if you haven't read this article, I'll just summarize real quick for you again. It'll be fine because I'll just put some quotes uh, in the slides. but. Um, what Fister is saying largely is that like we're seeing a lot of really divergent ideas about reality these days, right? Up to and including a lot of conspiracy theory buy-in. Um, and she's saying that this is kind of a reflection, like at its base, a reflection of how people have really different ideas about how you decide what is real, right? This is really um, a question of epistemology, which you can see is like the one tag they used for this article, epistemology, that's at the, at the heart of it. Um, and she's saying, you know, like information literacy, the idea of, of teaching people how to find and use and evaluate information, uh, it's not new. It's not as though folks who um, are all in on QAnon never got exposed to that stuff, but she's arguing that um, perhaps some of our more canned classroom uh, lessons or assignments aren't translating particularly well to the pretty pretty complicated realities that, that we have in our, our information systems. Um, so again, some of the things she's talking about are um, information systems, promoting agency. Um, yeah. So those are some of the themes that I pulled out of the article. Um, and actually, I, I think the one that, that I want to start with is, is this idea of, of epistemology. Um, she, she mentions that um, a lot of folks who live in this, what does she call it? She, the library of the unreal, like folks who are really all in on um, conspiracy theories or, or other maybe just questionable, questionable beliefs that don't have a basis in the kinds of uh, ways of knowing that we want to promote, you know, science and, and journalism. Um, they are, they may have a lot of experience um, with really different ways of knowing. Um, she references the work of Francesca uh, Tripodi. Kristen, one Russian. second. Can you, can you just check your area and make sure your microphone is, um, it's just a tiny bit staticky for a couple of us. Staticky. Right. Ooh, I bet it's the stack of papers I have. I'll try that. Here. Now talk again. Better? Nope. No. 
It's okay. It's it's barely staticky. Mm -hmm. I just uh, if it was an easy fix, I was going to fix it, but it's it's completely fine. So carry on. Okay. Okay. If anyone has any other workarounds they want me to try, let me know. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I really can't crack that. Crack I think it quickly. actually is a little better now that I see okay. it. But we're all good. I appreciate you saying that, even if you're just trying to make me feel better. Uh, so anyway, so epistemology is one of the, the main themes that runs through this article. Um, and I definitely see some connection there between a particular digital habit of mine. Now go with me, because this might not be obvious at first. Um, but purposeful communication um, asks us to consider the audiences and context of the messages that we encounter um, and to understand how they intersect um, but also how we use them to construct meaning. And to me, that's the biggest connection back to this idea of, of epistemology. So I'm, I'm going to take a page out of the CoLab playbook. I understand that in every presentation, you have to have your audience members read one of your slides. So uh, do I have a volunteer to read this quote from Barbara Pfister? Don't all jump up at once. I would be happy to read it. Thanks, Martha. While it may seem odd to use the phrase crisis of faith, we are experiencing a moment that exposes a schism between two groups. Those who have faith there is a way to arrive at truth using practices based on epistemology that originated in the enlightenment. And those who believe events and experiences are portents to be interpreted in ways that align with their personal values. Yes, thank you. So our first um, set of questions, um, I'd love to hear from you guys about if that is something that you are experiencing in your classrooms. Are you seeing evidence of this? Um, do, do you ever find yourselves in situations where students talk about how they know what is true, what is real or not? Uh, and if they do, like, what the heck are they saying? I'd love to know. Um, and whether or not that is happening now, how can we open up more spaces for talking more, maybe more explicitly or discussing different approaches in our, in our classes? I'll buy you some time to think about that. And I, I will say that this is something that I think is, is super interesting that I'd like to do more in, but doing primarily one shots, like this is some pretty heavy stuff. Um, that I feel like maybe is better addressed in a room of people who have built more of a relationship with each other or with and with the instructor than, than I typically encounter. So, so I'm super curious to hear what you guys have to say. Are, are you looking for examples? Like what, what would you like us to? I'd like you to react to whichever one of those questions uh, triggers something in your mind. Yeah, if you have actual examples to share, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, um, I have an example. I have an example that you know about because you helped me with it. Um, so last semester when I was teaching disinformation as my wicked problem, one of my groups decided that the um, claim that they were going to investigate for the first project of the semester was, is Joe Biden mentally fit to be president, right? And they came to the conclusion that he was not mentally fit. The reason they came to that conclusion is because nobody was saying he was mentally fit. Like everything they found said he wasn't mentally fit, right? And so uh, it, it was a really challenging conversation with the students to talk about why that might be. And um, Kristen was very helpful in finding some stuff about data voids for me to, to use in the classroom and, and to talk about with students, but that is that's a situation where I don't think a one-off information literacy presentation you would never get to something like that. Um, I have a story that kind of fits this that I still kind of struggle with and feel like <laughs> sort of like guilt when I remember it. Um, I, uh, at my previous institution, I was teaching a first year seminar and the focus of the seminar was on digital literacy and digital identity really was the, the way we framed it for students. And it was happening at a time, this was in fall of 2015. So it was happening at a time when I personally was beginning to see more and more and probably many of us were beginning to see more and more 
um, on our social media feeds of people sharing misinformation. And then sometimes someone would come along and fact check it, right? Like you always, you have that one friend, I'm often that friend, who's like, wait, I looked this up on Snopes and sorry, you're wrong, right? And, um, and it was sort of a newer phenomenon at that time. These days, I think that's almost passe. Like, wasn't that funny when people used to fact check us? Um, and so I brought this up to my class because it, it kind of played into what we were talking about with social media and digital identity. And I said, you know, when you share on social media, when you share a story or uh, um, a piece of like quote unquote news or even, you know, a meme that intersects with news or current events, do you fact check it? And we talked about Snopes and other, at that point, Snopes was really the fact checking website. Now there's lots of them. And many of them had never heard of Snopes. And almost across the board, they said, no, we don't fact check stuff. And I said, well, do you think there's a problem with sharing this information that isn't true? And they're like, not really. And I said, well, why is that? And they basically, their response was, we're not sharing it for truth. We're sharing it because it's a good story. Like it gets people's likes. It makes people laugh. Um, it's, that's not what it's about. And at, this was like a year before like the presidential election. And so I was just sort of like, oh, well, isn't that an interesting phenomenon? And then like a year later, I was like, oh, like why didn't I dig into this more and talk about it more? Um, and interestingly, so I brought this up. Um, some of you are familiar with Mike Caulfield's work around you know, information literacy and, and online information literacy. I, and he came and presented at my school. And I brought this anecdote up as a question in the Q&A and I asked him, you know, like, what do you make of that? And like, how do we deal with that? And he said something that he's repeated in other places, but it's really stuck with me. And what he said is he said it, a lot for him, a lot of this had to do with the conflation of social media with news. Mm -hmm. So social media, with which many of us see as a space for entertainment and a, a space for socialization and sort of low stakes interaction had increasingly become also where people were getting their news from. And these things were just sort of intersecting and interweaving in ways that made it so hard for people to understand the code switch, right? Like when they were going from like a funny meme where it's not really, really matter if it's true to no, this is a news story and it's gonna affect people's opinions and minds and votes. Um, and I just like, that's all I've got. Like I, it was a really strange, like, um, revelation to have my students say that it sat with me it's continues to sit with me and I still wonder like what I could have done or should have done to intervene in that moment to get them to think more deeply about like when it's not just for likes like what what does it mean when we share and it's not just for likes I think it's so interesting that it came up in a class on digital identity because I've heard um, something something pretty similar to what your students told you which is that sharing things isn't it's sometimes about um, signaling to your in-group, signaling your identity, your membership um, in a certain circle. Yeah, and, and it isn't always about the facts in that scenario. So it's funny that like you were in a digital identity class and they're like, yeah, we're doing this basically for identity reasons, <laughs> right? Um, and I don't know what the answer is either, but one thing that I think a lot about is how, how much of this could be fixed if we made things explicit, if we helped students, if we helped them articulate the difference <laughs> between social media as a tool for like building your online persona and your identity and social media as information gathering and an information system that disseminates horrifyingly uh, inaccurate <laughs> information as well. Yeah, I wonder if we can just how much just kind of inoculating them with the idea that there are two functions, if that would get us anywhere. I don't know. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to share? Yeah, I can share briefly. Um, I'm new to the PSU community. Um, I actually work on the COVID rapid response team. <laughs> and Thank you. There's and so, no disinformation related to COVID. Limits. No, never. I know. So obviously I was like, oh my gosh, yes. So this comes up a, a lot. I mean, less often, I hope now I came onto the team in January. So pretty late in the game. Um, I'm sure this was, I know this was experienced more in my team um, 
you know, in the year and a half prior. Um, but still it comes up um, quite, quite often. And I'm not surprised, right? But um, it is really difficult in the moments where, especially I, I, I help with contact tracing, I help with the isolation protocols and the lead for the isolation protocols. And, you know, there's a, often a lot of questions. Um, some of them are very genuine and some of them definitely come with the like assertion, like, well, I, I don't have to do this and here's why, like, are these tests even, you know, effective? Why this, that, or the other? Um, you know, and in my role, of course, I'm like, look, these are the policies that we've put in place. I'm happy to answer your questions. Yes, these tests are effective. Here's, I'm happy to send you some data. Um, you know, um, you can speak with my managers. Um, we can all talk about this. Um, and most of the time, they're agreeable. Now, I don't know that, but I wonder, as who's passionate about, um, digital literacy and literacy in general, right? Information literacy that, where does this lead? And it's, it's scary. I know that this has had a lot of impacts on the way that this has all played out and um, it leads to, a, a, <laughs> I'm like holding my chest because I'm like, it's very concerning. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, you're making me think of uh, I've never felt so clearly. We have a, a saying on campus that, like, if you work here, it doesn't matter if you're your faculty or staff, like, you are an educator. And I feel like you must be living that so, so much. Um, you've also reminded me of um, a podcast episode that I listened to recently that was about talking to people um, who are vaccine hesitant. You know, this isn't exactly what you're saying, it's just an adjacent topic. Um, but the name of the podcast is, is You Are Not So Smart. David McCraney is the, is the host. Um, but he did um, a two plus hour episode on this very topic because a lot of times the really direct and more combative approaches that we take to, to misinformation, um, they backfire, right? And they cause people to dig in even more. Um, you're nodding in a way that suggests to me, you know all about this. <laughs> Um, yes. But anyway, if anyone else is unfamiliar with it, I uh, highly recommend that the episode just Google you are not so smart um, uh, vaccine hesitancy, maybe, and it will come right up. Um, but a lot of it is about promoting reflection. It's about promoting, um, getting people to prompt them to think about, okay, I have this belief. Well, how confident am I in that belief? Where did it come from? Um, and how confident am I in the sources it came from? You know, just if you can even get someone to that point of reflection, I think that's sadly sometimes like the best you can hope for. <laughs> so, thank you for sharing that, that experience. All right. I, unless someone else wants to jump in, I'm gonna move to our next, to the next theme I pulled from this article. Sound legit. All right, so that's that next theme that I saw was the idea of information systems. Um, so by, by information systems, like, I mean, I think pro probably this is familiar territory to a lot of the folks who are here, but um, so any, any group, any method that creates information, that disseminates information, um, any of the platforms we use to encounter information, um, so Fister in, in the article, she points out that like a lot of these, the components of our information environment, um, they're, they're within these broader contexts of like social and political influence um, and knowing the effects that all of that has on our information systems um, is something very important to students and something that maybe they aren't necessarily getting in our, in our classes. And the digital habit of mind that I that I was reminded of in thinking about this is integrated perspective, um, which is about students um, using like this network environment that we're in to be exposed to new perspectives. Um, but I think you can only do that effectively. You can only get, really get a genuine exposure to new perspectives. If you kind of understand the forces that are operating in these information systems that are gonna um, be more likely to push you some kind of information than others. Um, 
and, and just being aware that that is possible and knowing some of the ways that it is happening. So can I get another volunteer to read out a short, short quote? Who wants to read the next one? I will read it. That is not short. It's short. <laughs> While, school, while school-based efforts to promote information literacy typically are tied to producing information, college papers, digital projects, PowerPoint slide decks, students are not invited to reflect on how information flows through and across platforms that shape and are shaped by participatory audiences and influencers. They aren't learning much about how information systems, including radio, print, journalism, academic and trade book publishing, television, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, make choices about which messages to promote and how those choices intersect with political messaging and the social engineering of, ooh, the social engineering of interest groups. Good phrase. Thanks, Robin. All right, fair enough, that was not short. So our discussion, uh, discussion questions that I propose um, for thinking about information systems is, I'm just curious um, where this is showing up in our curriculum already, where it's showing up explicitly or where it's just sneaking in around the margins um, and or where, where could it, where would it be appropriate to put this in? Because um, again, this is another topic that you're never, you're never gonna cover in a one-shot information literacy course. And like, no one's even trying, like, that would just be silly. Um, so where is the best home for this kind of education? Um, does it already, have a home on our campus? Are you seeing this? Are you engaging with this? Um, or where do you wish you were seeing it? I'll chime in. Um, I think we talk a little bit about this in the TWP class I teach. Um, especially we've, we run into things because, because what I do teach is kind of technical with drinking water and I search constantly for drinking water terms. And like, just, I had the students like Google their hometown and drinking water. And every time I put it in, my first result was uh, a different one than they did, than they got. So it was, in, they could see that there, which is like, Google is giving back different results based on what we've clicked on in the past a little bit. Um, so they got to see it a little bit there. Um, but I do talk, I talk about it, but I'm not sure how well they actually see it other than, I don't know if that's what you're looking for. That was brilliant. No, I, I find I'm always bringing up Google when I'm meeting with the TWP classes because we know, we know that's where the first place that they go, right? We can hopefully like give them other options, but at the end of the day, it's the first place a lot of us go for information and it's a wonderful tool as long as you're aware of some of these. Um, the shortcoming, it's just a side effect. There was this, there was this amazing uh, tweet thread going on this weekend. I don't know if anybody saw this, but uh, DuckDuckGo announced that they were going to start downgrading uh, disinformation in their search results. And a bunch of folks on Twitter got so angry about that. They were like, if I wanted um, curated search results, I would be using Google. You know, like they were so mad about it. And a bunch of other people were the people that I follow were like, what is this totally neutral algorithm that you're imagining? What, like, what, like, what would that even look like? Do you want to like type in fast food near me and get articles about hedgehogs? Like, no, you don't want that. Like, every, like, the point of search engines, right, is that they rank things. They are all doing it, and like, it's just silly uh, to be mad about that. I thought. It was, there were some amazing tweets uh, on both sides, like tweets I couldn't believe people were tweeting and then really funny takedowns of those tweets this weekend. And I'll send them to you if you're interested. Um, but yeah, I think um, search, search engines and the algorithms that they run are a super important piece of this puzzle uh, for students to, to get. And I don't know, I find like there's some awareness on their part, I, I tend to ask, when I'm talking, just to the TWP folks, uh, is, is this new to you? Are you aware of the personalization of results? Are you aware of some of these problematic aspects? I don't know, there's, a, there's always a minority of students who are like, oh yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I think they're aware of it, but I think that I've had several students ask like what to do about it or how to 
get around it this year. Like they've asked, how do we know a source is valuable? How do we know um, what search terms to put in to get good results? So I've, I've gotten some good questions um, about how to engage with that, which has been kind of exciting. That is excellent. <laughs> uh, my head is exploding. And the way that it has through this entire series, I've had head explosions um, because of some of the conversations that we've had. This one kind of comes from what you're saying now and kind of from Kathy's little thing in the chat where she was talking about, you know, remember in the old, old days where we used to just say like, the New York Times is a credible source. Like this website is not. And like, you know, we had much simpler sort of approach to, and then Kathy was asking like, maybe that was always flawed, you know, from the, from the beginning or was it a simpler time? Like who knows? But it reminds me of my um, research on like history and historiography where, and especially when I would work with students on early American history and I would sort of talk about, um, you know, there is no experience of the past that is unmediated. So like, even if you go to a primary source about the Salem witch trials, it's if it's written by Cotton Mather, who was there, it's very different than if it was written by, um, you know, one of the accused who, who was there. Like, so the, the, I'm almost wondering if one of the keys because yes, yeah, some dis some misinformation is disinformation designed to to like, you know, lead for to political ends. But in some ways, like everything, every platform. But even if you get the news straight from the goat itself, right? Like it's going to be mediated. So maybe it's not so much about telling students like, which really I think is kind of your point. It doesn't really work when you just say like your source is bad. Like you have to go to a good source. But instead to say, you cannot access information, right? That is not filtered through these information systems. Even if you talk to a friend, right? Like you're kind of still gonna get these mediated environments. So maybe the question is, and it also makes me think a lot about how we talk about disciplinarity at Plymouth State, where I think some faculty are really starting to do exciting things where they're making their disciplines more visible to students. They're saying, you know, science really isn't the, the truest, realest, most objective thing. It's that we have a particular kind of lens on how truth works and here's what that looks like and here's how we do it. Seems to me one of the strengths of all of this for us at Plymouth is that we're getting closer and closer to like stepping away from content and really starting first with the question of how you approach the content. And I think that's why we're also talking a lot more about pedagogy at Plymouth too, because we're talking more about like, oh, if you're gonna do that, you can't just give the textbook information. You have to really talk about how, but all of this is really about talking with students about how you're coming to your subject, how you're coming to your information. Um, but that's gonna be the, you know, that's with everything, I mean, even the sources we completely 100% trust as real, and we say this is real science and that is not real science. I mean, one of the points we've had to make in science recently is that, you know, what's true today in science might not be true tomorrow in science. So, you know, you're still talking about being able to ask questions as opposed to being able to sort, right? So, I'm sorry, but my head is exploding with all of these cool ideas, as usual, Kristen Wicks. That's great. And you're anticipating several of the things that I was hoping we would go later. Like I couldn't ask for a better, better segues than that. Um, but yeah, when, when you start talking about um, the pedagogy and how we are really focusing, focusing a lot on that here um, in this article, um, Krister talks in like a few different places. It comes up a couple of times about how traditionally some of the, the assignments we've given students, they aren't gonna help them navigate these other things. Like if you assign something uh, and say, well, you must use thus and such kind of source and it can only be this and, and we're definitely gonna exclude these kinds of sources. Um, like a, a little bit, that's, I mean, that's artificial and it's not really how people look for information. So again, it's less transferable to context outside of, of academia. Um, but I think some people, uh, it really puts, puts their, puts them, gets them bent out of shape. Like, 
to, to say that and maybe neglect to talk about the why behind it. I think maybe you get more traction on that if you talk about why you're doing something, which I mean, I think is something I've heard Martha say a bunch of times, like explain to students why you are doing X, Y, and Z and you will, you will get a lot more buy-in from them. Brilliant. Can, can I just add one thing yeah, about yeah, what yeah. that previous slide? Um, you know, when when I when I teach TWP, both when I do climate change as as a wicked problem and when I do disinformation, it's all about this. Like both of those are about navigating disinformation. What has happened to me <laughs> as a result of teaching those that those topics for TWP is I've gotten really discouraged, like I, because it's so hard and you're you're battling against this tidal wave that pushes students exactly in the opposite direction so i you know where does this approach to understanding information fit like it's got to be the entire curriculum like i i just don't see any other way unless every time we talk about any content we're talking about this kind of stuff yeah, and that's, that's the thing about information literacy. It's like everywhere and nowhere, right? It is all over, it's everyone's job and therefore it's no one person's job. When we have these kind of like distributed responsibilities, right? We know how that can go. Um, yeah, there is an added challenge. I think you are just articulated really well that it needs to be everywhere needs to be part of everything that we do, but we also have a lot of other things to do. You know, we have a lot of learning outcomes to teach. So yeah, it's a challenge for sure. Um, yep, so I'll segue to this. This, one, this one's a bit of a reach. I don't know if it was really a strong theme in our article, but as I just said, it came up a bunch of times. This, this idea that our, our, the assignments and the lessons that we're giving students uh, transferable to context outside of school. Um, I feel like a, a lot of the, maybe when I first started, a lot of the info lit sessions that I did, like very explicitly, it was about me coming in and helping students satisfy the requirements of the thus and such assignment, which was to find six peer reviewed sources, you know? Um, and it did say, oh, well, we're absolutely not gonna look at any blogs, right? With no discussion of like, all the variety in blogs and like some blogs have editors and like all of this, this stuff. Um, so one way um, that Fister talks about this in the article is talking about the idea of uh, teaching students to, um, to ask questions. Uh, I'll get a quote on this in a minute. Um, but that makes me think of this particular digital habit of mine, which is problem solving, which is a lot about First, being able to articulate the problem, being able to articulate the question. Um, problem solving is actually where I see like the almost the most information literacy connection in a traditional sense, where we talk about search, searching and search strategies. Um, but I think before you get to any of that, you've got this issue of, of articulating questions and identifying the, the problem that you want to research. So can I get one more volunteer to read a, uh, can we go with a medium length quote? I would read. Thank you, thank you. The vast majority of graduates in the PIL lifelong learning study feel the research they were asked to do in college failed to prepare them to ask questions of their own. After all, faculty were the ones defining what questions were worth asking and where legitimate answers could be found in library databases, in the stacks, or in the textbook. Thank you. Um, so this, this whole article that I'm pulling all these quotes from is actually a year old. It's from the, the series. They probably do, I don't know, four or five essays a year. But another one came out just last February. Also, last February, like last month, February. Um, also by Barbara Pfister, who, as you can tell, like I'm a big fangirl of Barbara Pfister. Um, that was entirely about this issue of asking questions of promoting curiosity in students. Um, I've got a link to it at the end if you're interested in it and you can go check that out too. Um, but uh, for our discussion purposes, it just makes me think like, 
if we reflect on our own practices, are we encouraging students to frame questions or are we pushing them in ways that kind of promote the search for like ready-made answers? Um, and what is, the, what, what is the difference? Like if we are articulating that, go find something out versus go find why sources or however many sources they need to look. Um, so I guess I invite you now to talk about either your experiences um, with your, your assignments or if you're observing just general patterns around you, right? So maybe you're reading this and thinking, oh, yeah, sometimes my assignments are very um, focused on particular knowledge or ready-made answers. You don't have to out yourself. You're like, that's fine. <laughs> I also think there's probably time and place for that. Um, so you can either talk about your, your assignments or patterns you see across the university. You know, I, I kind of feel like our conversation about this, I mean, you know, the people who are here are here because they already care about this and, and recognize that our <clears throat> sort of traditional way of doing things isn't working, right? I, I have lots of conversations with TWP instructors, and I kind of feel like people are relying on their own um the ways that they were taught information literacy, right? Like that whole idea of go to the library and the reason you go to the library is so that you can find that book. And, and it's not a broader conversation. I don't know, it, it just like it's hard to get our students to think about information literacy and, and do it. I think our challenge is really to get faculty to be thinking about information literacy in a different way. I feel that for sure. Yeah. I feel like all the time I am battling against my own dispositions to you know, reproduce the education I had, which I know exactly how I feel about the education I have. And I mean, it's not especially positive, but I still, if you don't fall back on that, you're, you're creating whole new methods and you know having to learn whole new methods even if you don't create them uh, that is a real challenge I, agree. I, I just wanted to piggyback on that um because I totally agree with that and I I'm glad Kathy said it because I was trying to figure out how to how to say that in a way that didn't make it sound like I'm like throwing faculty under the bus because that's not really the point but you know I used to do a presentation again at my old institution where I would go into for, um, into first year seminars and talk about digital identity. And one of the cornerstones of that presentation was explaining how search engines work. And it, lots of students didn't know, but almost always the faculty member who, who was teaching the class would, would be floored by what they were learning. And that, again, that's not like, why would everybody know that, right? Like this isn't something that we teach it isn't something that you have to like really want to learn this and go out and study it and and read about it in order to kind of um kind of understand it and it's easier to just assume that that the, the algorithms are neutral and we can trust the search engine and 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 then when you put that up against what you just said Kristen which is that people are and what Kathy was pointing out which is that like we're trying people have a way of researching and a way of understanding information that, that they learned and that they're comfortable with and that they see as sound, then you really just end up with this kind of conundrum where it's not just, it's not just that our students need this guidance, it's that our faculty do. And I absolutely see this with my kids in K-12, right? Like they are still getting the lesson that like you can trust .orgs, but not .coms, you know, like, so like it goes really deep and and I don't, I wish there was like a better way to get, get more people learning and understanding the impact of this. It goes really deep and also it goes on forever. It's, it, it just never ends. Like there's always a new thing to learn about how Google is working. There's always a new thing to learn about this new platform. Um, when I was reading the the other essay that I just mentioned, the one that came out last month, there was a lot of stuff in there about how all those um, 
the way Google presents its results. And you know, there'll be a, like a sidebar that pulls out facts from various websites that really, I had never thought of this. This was, this was I mean, it wasn't news to me, but again, having it be made explicit was new to me. But by pulling out these, these facts, we're really encouraging people to think about when you search for information, it's to go get a fact, it's to go get a thing. It's not a process of open inquiry. It's not about defining the question. You put your question in, you get your bullet points, the thing is done. And I was like, oh yeah, like that is probably messing with all of our minds all the time. And like, how many people were really consciously aware when Google started doing that? You know, like it just, you know, sneaks in a little bit. Oh, now there's a sidebar. Oh, now there's a sidebar and like um, text snippets right at the top. You know, it's just gradually changing, flying under the radar, but possibly having significant impacts on all of our cognitions and habits. It's pretty, pretty scary. I think one thing like just to maybe put like a hopeful gem into this rather depressing conversation is that we definitely haven't cracked the nut yet because I know just looking at these slides about digital habits of mind, I'm kind of overwhelmed between cluster learning, digital habits of mind, habits of mind. <laughs> like there's a lot of stuff and even being in the middle of it, I'm struggling to put it all together. But I would say we are on a journey of trying to create a slightly simpler framework that once we get, I would say maybe another year or so, like we would be able to do what we've done maybe with cluster learning or something to put this stuff together, not so that everybody in, or anybody could really teach, you know, well about information literacy because it's going to remain so thorny and complicated, but we might be able to get kind of, and I think we haven't cracked this not on disciplinarity either, um, but I think we could get closer to some basic premises that every faculty member could kind of, you know, whether they commit to implementing their class, they could commit to like understanding, you know, so um, I think we're kind of close to that. I don't think it's that far away. I think the question with this stuff is like, you know, what are we seeing as the core aha piece? that you would want to talk to both faculty and students about, um, not so that they can now do anything, but so they have that sort of wake up moment about how things are, are mediated. One big thing for me was like, really thinking about the word disinformation was so different than fake news, right? Because fake news is like, is it real or not? Fact check it. Disinformation is like, a campaign, a discourse, right? And you have to understand why it exists and what it's doing. And so I don't know what the thing is, but I think if we could find some of those simple things to hang our hats on, we could do something that, you know, I think that's the point of digital habits of mind is to try to get closer to some of that. I'd say we're almost there. Elizabeth raised her hand. So maybe she's actually gonna tell us right now. Yeah, yes, please. <laughs> I wish I had an answer to that. Now, I've just been thinking a lot about this last part of the first question of ready-made answers or encourage open-ended inquiry and thinking about the, especially with the TWP context, thinking about first-year students and sort of their ability to engage in open-ended inquiry because I think some of their prior experiences were so structured. Like sometimes I feel like, this is a question I ask myself in my classes a lot, like how much structure do I need to provide to scaffold an opportunity and how much structure almost takes away the essence of what I'm asking my students to do. And like, I think that, I don't know exactly how to approach that sometimes because if they're like so far away from, I think something that Kristen, you said about related to the Google searches, like I hadn't even realized that had happened. And I think part of it might be like, I sort of, if depending on the type of question I'm asking, I sort of like just without even realizing it, I approach searching in different ways, depending on my goal. But I, I wonder if students have really ever thought about that 
and how that makes them ready for open-ended inquiry and like the complexities of that, like, which is like sort of like unpacking like a lot of the questions I've had with first year students and why like sometimes when I may be engaging or suggesting something, why they're not like for lack of a better word, getting it because like they don't, they're not at a place to understand what that is or how to approach it. So it's just giving me a lot to like think about in terms of like this idea of like what support is needed, but how much support is too much. I think that that's a great point. That so here we are in this process of trying to encourage students to learn this new way of doing things. You know, maybe asking questions, formulating their own questions in a more open-ended way. Um, not only is it new to them, but it might be going directly against what a lot of their previous education has suggested is what they should be doing. Right? Like that's for sure an uphill, an uphill battle. That's a great point. You know, I, I think it, uh, Elizabeth and I have talked about that a lot, you know, like uh, when do, how much support is too much support and, you know, and I, I don't have an answer for it either. I think one of the things that is helpful in those conversations, and maybe this is some, like a beginning of something that we talk to faculty about is approaching every everything they're doing with the idea that what we're actually going to be talking about is the underlying structure of that thing so you know i think about a, a conversation you and i had a few years ago kristen about wikipedia right like my students come in to disinformation class and they're like yeah we can't use wikipedia but the really valuable conversation is about no let's let's talk about how wikipedia works and what is helpful about that and what is problematic about that and then we can make decisions about how how much to rely on wikipedia you know what, you know what i mean as a and so that conversation is is about providing structure for students in kind of an underlying way, as opposed to trying to structure the whole experience. I don't know exactly how to phrase that, but it feels like the structure comes from the way we engage with whatever it is we're engaged with. And the open inquiry comes from what we do with what we've engaged with. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't know. I've got if it in I, my head, I'm, not in my words. If I've correctly understood you, like it's actually a really intriguing idea to me that like, yeah, so you give them this piece of understanding how this tool that frankly they encounter constantly, how that works. You do it once, you do it in that context. And then not only can they like maybe transfer that to other contexts, but eventually they're gonna build up the knowledge that allows them to do um, more open-ended inquiry with some critical knowledge of, of how these these sources are, are made have I, was i close yes definitely the, the the open inquiry part is the yeah yeah i i don't have it so yes you were you were close <laughs> you know what would be awesome is a twp kind of focused on the uh, not not so much disinformation but the wicked problem of like reliability and news right like like how do you how do you know what to trust? Like, I mean, I, there's really not an answer to that. And I, I don't know, like you'd have to figure out how to model it. But what would be super cool is the presentations that they would give at the end, right? Like, because we need those presentations. We need students talking to other students about, because I could imagine a whole semester long project on like how the New York Times makes its editorial decisions, how Wikipedia is edited, um, like how some climate denying website functions or whatever, like though, if some people studied that and then like talk to each other, um, I wonder if we could actually get some great materials to use in all the TWP classes. Um, I would potentially teach that, but it's also really scary. <laughs> I mean, it's almost more scary than like homelessness or something because you feel like it could go south, you know, so, you know, so easily. 
as you're talking, I'm thinking too, Robin, what would be very cool about a TWP around something like truth and trust or like, you know, would be that you could have people come in from different disciplines and talk about, like you could have somebody come in and talk about journalism, like how those editorial choices are made. You could have somebody come in and from climate science and talk about like how truth is, you know, what truth means when you're doing this kind of research in science so that you get some of this like ways of thinking, habits of minds in these different disciplines as well. Um, I just think that'd be a very cool, a very cool exercise just to, to hear people a, talk about that. Could also be a cool um, open lab, you know, mm -hmm. if we're actually yeah. doing this thing, <laughs> could be a cool open lab because I could really imagine NCAPs and TWPs participating um, and upper level courses across multiple um, right. disciplines in their capstones, um, creating research that would speak to that in different areas too. I would love to have somebody from psych come in and talk about what truth is when you're talking about psychological sciences too, you know, like be interesting. Yeah. Or English, because yeah. I can't even talk about postmodernism without messing all of this up right, for <laughs> post-structuralism. So anyway. At the end of the Pister article, she's offering some like ideas about, you know, where to go from here. Uh, and she quotes Mr. Rogers. She says, look for the helpers, which is like, to me, I'm like, okay, so the communications and media studies department, like people who have these fundamental understandings of information systems. And I'm thinking of uh, like, our philosophy person and adjuncts um, who would, could be able to address the epistemology questions and, you know, in a certain light. So yeah, the psych folks, get them in here. I love this as our first open lab. Like this, this there's so many ways, absolutely everybody on campus could participate. Great. All right, I'm seeing that we are um, coming up on the end. I'm gonna just skip through the, the last theme I was gonna talk about was agency because like Robin, my inclination was to try to end on a positive note. Um, uh, so again, I see a lot of connection there with self-regulated learning. We don't need to go into that. Um, but I did like this quote, the kids are all right. Well, they may not have much academic knowledge and their technical understanding may be limited. Among students in any given class, there is likely to be a lot of knowledge about how information circulates through social media. Um, students may have significant experience in creating and measuring the reach of their messages, um, connecting what they're learning in class to their lived experiences online. It may encourage students to share what they know and are learning about information systems with their friends and families beyond academia. I thought that was a nice, uh, positive, hopeful quote to end on. Um, Again, I don't think that we quite have time to do this discussion justice, um, but again, it does seem to be like the discussion that is most closely related to um, the, the cluster pedagogy that we are embracing at Puma, so. And also yeah. like when they share public work, which is such a part of open education and project-based learning, I think part of what you're demonstrating here too is that that public work is necessarily gonna flow through information systems. And so that does mean engaging others, not only in the content, but in the information system with our students. And I think, you know, kind of what you're saying is, if we do a better job talking and teaching about information systems and literacy and whatever, then all those public products that we create are also going to do work around information environments and how knowledge flows. And we could be even more transparent about that. Um, so I think there's just a lot of good possibilities here. I love that. Um, I mean, that's I, not what I was saying. That's like way better than what I was saying. So thank you. Well, you <laughs> always doing. make my, my brain explode. And I will say, um, I'm not gonna save the chat, but for those of you who are listening on at home, it is a real loss for you because um, mm -hmm. the chat had lots of, lots of great stuff. So I'm really thankful to the folks who participated today. Um, we will post this recording along with Kristen's slides and the links to the articles that she discussed um, on our research resource page on the CoLab website, which should be up within a couple of days. And you can also find Martha's um, 
uh, session on the digital habits of mind. And Jane was the other presenter in our series talking about um, uh, writing as a tool for learning. And I had a lot of brain explosions in that one too. So um, um, yeah, so I'm going to stop recording unless you have, a, you have a last comment, Kristen. Yeah, yeah I do. I do want to plug the, the very last link on this slide, which we can put in those resources too. Um, judging from the name, I, it, it maybe wouldn't occur to you as like, oh, this is a thing I will click on in order to get ideas about how to teach about information systems or ideas for assignments. But that is literally what is there. So um, they did an analysis of this news coverage, and then they suggested a lot of activities that you could do. But here's the thing, you, they would be very easy to transfer out of COVID. Like I could understand, I could think of a lot of reasons you wouldn't want to talk about COVID right now, um, but they would be very easily transferable into other domains. So. Uh, really do click on that that COVID first hundred days link and look at the um, the learning resources links in there. They're they're brilliant. Thank you. And thank Thanks you guys everybody. for coming. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you.